All right, we do have a couple people coming in. Good morning. Uh, my name is Lindsay Doyle, and I'm here at the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame. Very excited uh, to be joined this morning by Anise, for, who is the co-founder of Amplify Horse Racing, a phenomenal nonprofit organization that is dedicated to spreading awareness and opportunities as far as education and careers go in the thoroughbred industry. She'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, and of course, Susan Moulton, uh, who has Janae. Janae is the horse that she chose to participate from her Safari North Farm uh, down in Versailles, Kentucky. Um, some of you may know that as the old Halls Mill Farm. We're gonna be talking to Susan today a bit about her career in the industry, what it's like being a woman in the thoroughbred industry, particularly a farm owner, um, as well as Full Patrol season four, um, how she's liking it, and some tidbits about Janae. Um, so I would like Anise just introduce herself very quickly, um, and then we will start. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for inviting me to join you and Susan. I was really excited for us to be able to put you know, a career spin on this as well and highlight careers in the industry, you know, along with celebrating Full Patrol, which is just such an incredible initiative. So my, my actual real job, I'm the equine education coordinator for the Kentucky Equine Education Project. And so under that, I run Amplify Horse Racing, which is a 501c3 to promote education and careers in the thoroughbred industry and really market and promote the sport to youth and showcase the wide variety of, of opportunities and programs and initiatives that are out there for youth and young adults to get involved in the industry. So we have our fingers and toes crossed that we'll be able to do more live engagement as we start to get into the summer and fall. But right now you can catch us on social media platforms and keep up with some of our different career and educational webinars and podcasts and things like that. That's great. Um, Susan, would you like to do a quick introduction before we start with Anise's questions for you? Sure. Um, with my horses, I'm still Susan Moulton, but I'm actually Susan Naylor Sellers now. I dropped the Moulton when I got married last year, but I still haven't had time to change all the horses' names. <laughs> or my, you know. You know. Um, but I'm from Texas and uh, still call Texas home, but I do have the farm up in Kentucky where I spend about half my time. Uh, especially foaling season. I'm headed back. I'm in Texas now, but I'm headed back up there in about a week to go help Janae. We fold, I think, about 16 mares this year total. And so we're a small farm and we want to keep it that way. Um, but I started in the industry years ago, my father, we, we ran at the bush tracks here in Texas. And uh, ironically, that's where uh, Shane used to ride some of my dad's horses back then. That we didn't give each other a second thought then. But, um, but I, so I've been doing this, um, Wow, so about 53 years, I guess. So you're a beginner, that's what you're telling us. Yes. Very new in the industry. <laughs> exactly. Learning. I have lots so, to learn. Thank you every day. <laughs> We're gonna go ahead and start uh, with Anise. Anise has a couple questions basically about your career and your life in the thoroughbred industry. And then afterwards, we're gonna talk a little bit more about Janae uh, and season four of Full Patrol. So go ahead, Anise. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, you actually kind of just led right into one of my first questions about how you got started in the industry. You just mentioned your dad and, and growing up in Texas, but what were your earliest memories or your, your earliest exposure to the thoroughbred industry? Honestly, before we had Paramutual here in Texas, uh, we had a few bush tracks around and my dad loved the horses and he was lucky. That's one thing I've never had is luck, I think. You have to make your luck sometimes. My dad was so lucky. And um, that's one of my first memories. I was probably five or six years old, um, just going to the bush tracks here. And then dad went on over when he have a nice horse. He, would, he was an owner and uh, we'd run at the fairgrounds and then old Arlington before Arlington burned. I remember as a little girl being on the carousel at Arlington. We'd go spend about a month up there during the summers, but great memories. I remember, you know, about the time I could start to read, I could read the racing form and the program. I, I loved the horses. I loved to ride. And uh, it's funny, I always wanted to be a jockey. I used to pretend I used to hike up. I had an old, we were my dad was a cattle rancher. So we just had Western saddles, but I found my, my grandfather's old flat English saddle and I'd hike the stirrups up as high as I could and just run my cow pony fast as I could. But um, never got to do that. But I, uh, 
you know, I, I just, I loved it. I loved the horses and the speed and just their heart. It was just amazing. But those are great memories here growing up in Texas. So define to our viewers, what is a bush track for those who might not know? Ah, okay. It's kind of like, you know, fairgrounds. And, um, you know, I, I think a, a lot of the greatest riders in the country started the bush tracks in Louisiana. Um, but it's, uh, there's no, no gambling. It's, uh, well, except maybe in the parking lot back and forth between friends, but, uh, they have a set of races, you know, maybe five or six races that day. And it's usually at the fairgrounds at little towns like Seguin and New Braunfels, probably little towns in Texas that a lot of people have never heard of. And it was also a bit quarter horses and, uh, and thoroughbreds. The tracks weren't very well maintained and weren't very big. So they were all mostly short races, but we always had thoroughbreds. We never had quarter horses and um, that, you know, Texas and Louisiana, that, that was a big thing. And, and again, that's where a lot of our greatest riders came from and our great trainers. That's pretty cool. I remember our, our county fairs up home would always have demolition derbies, but I think I would have preferred horse racing at our county fairs. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> What was it about the thoroughbred industry from the start that really captivated you? You mentioned the horses. Was it the horses or the excitement of it or just the fact that you were so immersed in it growing up? I guess that's it. And it's the people. Um, something about people, you know, probably all horse people. There, there's something about someone that loves a horse so much. And um, we just, we kind of have our own lingo and, um, our own set of values. And I'm not saying that's always a good thing, but um, they just, uh, but they're really heartfelt and down deep country people, you know? Um, and and I, I like that about them, but and I, I think it's, um, there's dog lovers and there's horse lovers and uh, there's cat lovers too, probably. And there's just something about the horse lovers that, that just, um, I don't know, they're just, and their characters, they're, they're interesting. They love passionately. Um, and, you know, just like, you know, the thoroughbreds are so, you know, to, to see them on the track and then, you know, try so hard, there's just such a, such a beautiful thing to watch. And, and I think that passion from these animals ignites these people. Like and the, it's hard to leave. I, I've tried to, sorry, I, I've, I've tried to leave the industry a couple of times and I always come back. <laughs> Oh gosh, it's like the heart of the people really matches the, the heart of the horses. But I never, I never like to try and define somebody else's career because I find that people's careers in the thoroughbred industry tend to be very fluid and very multifaceted. So I'd like to hear your def definition of your career in the thoroughbred industry and how that has maybe changed over time or, you know, when first when you wanted to be a jockey, how did that change into something else? <laughs> Well, it's interesting. Um, like I said, I kept trying to leave and it kept pulling me back. That passion keeps pulling you back. You know, when I was a little girl, I followed my dad around. And then, you know, when you're a teenager and you're into more other things, like maybe boys, and um, I kept leaving. The, and it's funny because that's when my husband now used to ride for my dad. Um, we found a wind picture where I was probably 23 and Shane was 19, and um, I was about to get married, and I never gave him a second look, then, but we're both in the winter circle together. And he, when we met, which was about six years ago, I started digging pictures out, and, I, and he's like, I think I found your dad, and I'm like, well, that's me right there, so, but that was kind of, I'd go in and out, you know, I, I'd uh, get off into other things, like getting married, and then I'd come back, <laughs> and um, so I, like I said, my father was an owner, and I, uh, when I was married to my first husband, we owned a horse for a while. And so we were interested then and would go to the races. And then I kind of got out of it again. And I was in the travel business for 20 years. Um, so I traveled quite a bit and that took me away. And uh, then I uh, settled, you know, back down in San Antonio when I was 10 minutes from Matama. And that's when we, we got Paramutual over here and they built this beautiful track. And it was 10 minutes from my home. So I... Um, I got into it again and we had a lot of horses over in Louisiana then. So we, you know, t the trainer at the time was Buster Leger. I think Buster's still over there. I'm not sure if he's still training and, uh, you know, convinced him to come over here and we started, you know, the Texas circuit. There's a lot of great horsemen in Texas. So when we got Paramutual here, that was fantastic. And, um, and then I would um, get off into other things again, like motherhood. Um, I had two boys 
And um, as they were growing up, I, with Ritama right here, I started uh, pin hooking. I had a partner here, Charles Weston, and we would go by yearlings and break, you know, road. So we'd break and train them. I used to, I rode jumpers in between. And he said, you know, you ride, why don't you start galloping for us? And so I, you know, broke them first and then I'd start galloping and then I'd start breezing them and I loved it. And I rode on the track here for, I guess, about six or seven years. And I was, I quit when I was 45. So I thought, you know, I've been so lucky. I've seen so many friends get hurt badly. And, you know, I had a few falls, but, you know, I, I really got to enjoy it. There's nothing like being on the back of a thoroughbred in the morning and watching the sun come up. There's just nothing better. And um, I quit February of 07. I breezed my last horse and said, okay, I've been lucky. I'm going to stop. And then my, my little boy was killed that June in a car crash. And I just, I just destroyed me. I, you know, I thought, you know, I, I uh, got to do something to give back. So I, I, um, I love hearing about you being on so many boards and what's involved with so many nonprofits, because that's what I've done really the last 14 years. And I got completely out of the industry. We had a few horses then that I had to finish and sell. And then I just walked away. I, I couldn't have told you who was in the Derby that year or anything. I was totally focused on children's charities and it's called the Will Smith Foundation. We have um, a website out there and we're still very active, but it pulled me completely out of the industry for about six years. And uh, it's funny, I kind of came back into it. Uh, Michelle Lovell, who I used to gallop with out at Rotama, um, she and I got together and she was training and, you know, I thought that's again, to support another woman. And she's such a great horsewoman. I said, Leo, find me a little horse. So we got a little $20,000 claim in horse. And I was up at Keeneland and, uh, there was a nonprofit event afterwards for disabled jockeys and supporting kids in Africa. And that's something I'd done because, um, we traveled to Africa. My company was Safari Bloodstock. Um, because we hunted, even even Will, my little one, hunted, and I still hunt a little bit. So we um, we all, after the races that day, went to this nonprofit, and that's where I met Shane Sellers. So the rest is history. He had a farm at the time that he was partners with up there um, on Pisgah Pike, and since then, they've sold that farm, and uh, three years ago, I bought Paul's Mill, and so he moved over there, and then we just got married in October. So that's kind of the the quick version of my whole career in and out of the horse industry. But now, so what I've brought to the table, um, Janae is, um, and I'm not jumping ahead on all your questions, but Janae was um, a, a pin hook, you know, bought her as a yearling and was going to sell her as a two year old. And uh, I was stubborn. I wanted 44 and they were stuck at 30. And I said, Nope, I'll run her. And then she went and, and won the little maturity for me that the hundred thousand dollar stake and uh, ran out. She had a lot of talent as a two year old. And so, suddenly I was back in the broodmare business. Um, my dad did that for a while, but I was never that interested in the broodmares. I mean, down here in Texas, we, um, we just let them go out in the fall. Usually um, that's the way my dad did it. Anyway, you found them the next morning and put a little iodine on the navel, gave them a shot and, you know, told them good luck. But so I really respect these farm managers in Kentucky, how much care they give. I don't know that I got that much care when I was in the hospital having my kids. Um, but um, Anyway, that, that's, that's kind of my career in and out of the horse business for a long time. So now I am pretty much doing everything. We have a handful of mares. We have, um, I still love pin hooking. I, I just sold a, a couple in Ocala and we did really well. I'm so happy to see that sale be so strong. Um, after the year that we had last year, horse people are so hardworking and um, COVID really, really knocked us to our knees. So it, this feels like a rebirth this year for that sale to be so, so good. I hope it sets the tone for this whole year for us. Right. Yeah, I hope the same. So I have a, a two-part question going off of all of that. What would be your best piece of advice for both a young person who's looking to start their career in the thoroughbred industry or also someone who, you know, might have gotten out of it or had experienced a career change and is looking to get back into it or maybe get into it for the first time later on in life. A, a question that we tend to get a lot with Amplify is people saying, hey, I'm, I'm looking at a career change. I'd love to go into the thoroughbred industry, but am, is, it, is it too late? Because you really experience getting into it early on and then getting out and getting back in. I think you have a great perspective on, on both of those sides. Absolutely. Because it does change so much. Um, 
you know, like I, I said, I came back, there were people like Wayne Catalano. I had no idea who Wayne Catalano was, you know, when Wayne had won two Breeders' Cups. And now, you know, he's one of my dearest, closest friends. I had no idea who he was. He picked me up at the airport when um, when I was going up to see Michelle that time. I'm, oh, do you, you know, you're from Louisiana. Do you know Glenda Lahusi? Do you know Kerwin Clark? Um, it changes so much. So whether you're getting into it for the first time or whether you've been out of it for a while and you want to come back, um, the first thing I'll tell you is I think people are very friendly in the industry and we want, we want people to come in. We want people to show interest and we need, you know, new people. And, um, I think they're very friendly and very welcoming. And I think the most important thing that all of us need to do is listen. It's, it's so funny in this industry, so many people that think they know it all. And the minute you think, you know, everything in the thoroughbred industry, you're in trouble because there's always something to learn there's and and just when you think you've got a horse in just the right spot something's going to happen um but i think if if you keep your ears open and sometimes your mouth shut um you're really going to learn and and that's one thing i think i love about this industry is you are always learning it is never boring just when you think you have things figured out they change on you so that's what makes it exciting that's where the passion comes in that's really funny. You actually just almost word for word brought up one of the questions I was going to ask. Like, I was going to ask, you know, you never stop learning. And so what is something that either you learned recently or that you'd like to learn more about in the industry? Um, gosh, that's a hard question. Um, wow. I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Um, and we can come back to it later. Maybe something will pop into your mind. I know, I know. Yeah, I'll have to think about that one um, because there is so much. It's, it's just a, a floodgate. Um, you know, I think one thing, here's, here's, this might be kind of a question. Because I'm from Texas and because, you know, Texas and Louisiana, speed, 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 and, and going, to, that's like Janae, you know. We took her early. We took her early. Well, a lot of times because of that, I, I think one thing I've learned recently is patience. That, that that would be my answer to this, I think. You're so anxious. It, it's difficult in this industry because so much money is offered up front. All the two-year-old races, all the three-year-old races. I'm in a situation now with Maniwa, which um, he just turned five, and he's really just coming into his own. And there's not much money to run at for a horse that, that age. Um, you know, all the big, big money. And so it's forcing these trainers and these owners to buy these precocious horses that are going to go early you know, so much money just at two-year-olds. And, you know, in my dad's day, you didn't even run a two-year-old. Um, barely, I, I think my dad's first and probably one of his best horses broke his maiden as a four-year-old. And then he went on to, to win like 32 races. Um, but I think that's something that I've really learned recently is, is patience with a horse and, and understanding that um, if you don't run him as a two-year-old, that's okay. You take your time and let them tell you. And then my last question before I pass it off to Lindsay is what, what would you say was your most valuable educational experience as you progressed through the industry? And that could have been a program or an interaction with another person or, you know, a, a lesson learned the hard way, anything that you felt was really valuable and you've taken with you over time. You know, really listening to my husband. Um, through the years, you know, so gosh, what did I say? I've been in the, around jockeys, around the riders for 50 something years. And, you know, you're always friendly with them. You talk to them in the paddock and, you know, I have a lot of friends that are jockeys, but now being really close with Shane and bringing him back into the industry, he'd really stepped out for a long time and was just basically running a saddlebred farm. He quit riding, I think about eight years ago. I'm not sure. Something like that. Um, but I thought I could watch a race and see what was happening. But if you sit next to Shane Sellers and listen to him say, oh man, look, he's this, he's that. And I thought, wow, okay, I see that. I see that. He's really taught me to look at a race in a different way. And that's from the rider's perspective of the kind of trouble they get in out there, the kind of quick decisions they have to make. And he's really brought a whole lot to the table and is helping me manage our, our racing end of it right now. Um, and that's probably the most valuable thing I've learned is, is to think about, I mean, we all know what great athletes these riders are, but um, to listen to things from their perspective, to really listen to them, 
is, uh, I think is important and, um, and to appreciate them. It's always good to, to take on another perspective or see things through another person's eyes or put yourself in somebody else's shoes because you never know what there is to gain from that. So that's great. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm going to hand it off to Lindsay for the, the full patrol part. Yeah. Well, so nice to meet you and thank you for this today. And thank you for all the work that you're doing in the nonprofit industry. That's oh, fantastic. I know you said you didn't have a good answer for that, but I think that was a very good answer uh, yeah. for the record. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we're going to transition a bit uh, into some full patrol related questions. Um, for those of you that were a little late joining the call or may be joining because uh, Anise put this out through Amplify as well, um, full patrol is a program that we host at the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame. It's an all online program. It's web based. There are live cameras uh, that follow in uh, pregnant mares and then uh, through the delivery and then afterwards for a couple of weeks or months, depending on when they deliver, of mom and baby. Um, so we have some educational opportunities through fullpatrol.com. We have the live cameras, um, and we just really, really enjoy putting on Full Patrol every year because it opens doors to a part of the industry that may not necessarily get as much attention as, for example, the races. Um, so we work with a couple of really phenomenal farms, the first of which uh, who already had their a foal this year is Mill Ridge uh, in Kentucky. Of course, we also have Safari North, which is Susan's farm that we're going to talk more about in just a minute. Uh, we have Three Chimneys, also in Kentucky, and we have Old Tavern Farm, which is up here in Saratoga Springs, New York. Our stallion this year, we like to have a featured stallion every year, um, is Taffet, and he is standing at Gainesway Farm. Um, so if you would like more information on Full Patrol, just go right ahead to the fullpatrol.com website. Uh, we have some new and exciting things coming up through there in the next couple of weeks as well. So with that out of the way, uh, Susan is participating with Janae and her farm Safari North for the first time this year for season four. So I just wanted to ask, I know you talked about Janae a little bit already, but why did you choose her as the mayor to participate this year? She's special to me. Like I said, she really got me back into having mares, which I never really did. That was my dad's thing. And um, again, she was supposed to be a pinhook. I was trying to get her sold. And um, because of a difference of about $10,000, I was hard headed and said, okay, now you got to beat her. And uh, she showed, she was a Louisiana bred, uh, big, strong, tough filly, tough filly. And um, of course that futurity, the sale futurity, that it was the sale in Texas that I was selling her at the April sale. The futurity that year, um, she, she went out and broke her maiden. I, I think she ran second and then she broke her maiden and then she went and won the futurity for me. And um, uh, that was, and it was actually the, the guy that was training for me was a friend I used to gallop with down here at Rotama too. And he didn't have a whole lot of horses. Um, his name is Brandon Jenkins. And he did a great job with her. And she was one that was just very precocious. Um, we I think she ran fourth at another little stake. And, but unfortunately, um, like I was talking earlier about having, being forced to run for the money when these horses are two years old, she didn't hold up. She, in fact, when I had our, our vet x-ray, she really didn't show that she was off at all. And we just thought, well, let's, let's just check her out. And he said, wow, you know, I can't even fix this. We can't even do surgery. So she retired. She retired. Um, after her two-year-old year. And um, I ended up bringing her to Miz and Mast that first year because I, I intended to race. I wasn't thinking about selling again. I thought, oh, I'll just race and have some fun with these horses. And uh, she was she has thrown two beautiful fillies for me that look just like her and are big and strong and tough like her. So, um, and we've got one by Daredevil coming up that'll be at the yearling sale this year. So, you know, Daredevil was early, Janae was early and had that precocious speed. So I'm hoping that'll be a really nice, and that's another filly. So we know what Daredevil fillies are doing now, right, Kenny McPeak? <laughs> and she is, uh, she's currently in full to Malibu Moon. Um, that's correct. I'm wrong, and she is due April 12th. And everyone I'm sure who's watching this is familiar enough with horse racing uh, to know that they usually do not go on their dates just like humans. Um, it's been my experience with Full Patrol that they tend to go a little bit over. Uh, so while we tell people it's the 12th, it may not be until the week after. Uh, so stay tuned on that. I know we very recently um, down at the farm, you moved her into her 
polling stall. So Janae's yes. coverage on Poll Patrol uh, is going to extend very soon as well. We'll have the paddock coverage and the stall coverage as well. And of course, uh, as usual with the past four years, that coverage, the live coverage of the mayors does extend as they get closer and closer to the polling date. Okay. So uh, your farm, Safari North, is probably widely recognized as the old Paul's Mills farm. Um, what did you do to sort of make this farm your own? And why did you decide to purchase uh, such, a, such a farm? Interesting. I'd, I'd wanted a farm in Kentucky for years, um, even back when my father was still alive, and, and just really never had the means to do it. And um, three years ago, um, one of our ranches down in South Texas that I'd been trying to sell for years and just couldn't get sold, got sold. And it had to be a quick decision. So I, I called um, an old friend also from the industry down here, Michelle Mullins. She's in the real estate business up there. I said, we got to find a farm. And I bet we looked at 15 farms, beautiful farms all over Kentucky. Paul's Mill, you know, I think it was the water as you drive across when you first drive in. It's, it's on this beautiful creek with an old mill house. Um, I, I'd heard of it before. I'd seen it advertised in magazines and just never thought it was anything that I could ever own. And uh, Ben Walden ended up, I was looking for about a hundred acre farm. That's, that's all I wanted really. Um, Cause I really wanted it for layups and you know, then I was going to have this one marriage a day. And um, so he had cut it down in half. And so I, it was 105 acres. It had a really nice, I wanted a, a historic home mm -hmm. as a beautiful old historic home on it that, that they had renovated. And you know, it's just, it's small, it's cozy. It's a very healing place. Anyone that has set foot, I was actually just with Gary Contessa this weekend. And when he was at the sales there in September, he went out to the farm. He, the yearlings he was buying, he was laying it. We do layups and, you know, when people buy at the sales, keep the horses until they ship them out. And Gary fell in love with that place. And so I just told him this weekend, I said, come back and stay. Because we have a lot of guest house, you know, you can stay at the mill house. It, it's a great place for people to come together and just heal just to walk up. There's a lot of hills, um, very much rolling hills. Not, I play polo, so I'm, that's a little disappointing. There's no flat place where I can really play polo, but it's great just to walk and beautiful trees on it. And it's, I like how it's kind of far away from everything else. We're 20 minutes from Keeneland, so we're really not. We're 20 minutes from Malone's. So that's important. It's my favorite place to eat. Um, it's just uh, you know, I'd, I'd heard because he's uh, been stood stallions out there, it was tough because people would have to haul out to the, it's also very difficult to get into in the winter. Um, our roads are very small. In fact, Paul's Mill Road is a one lane. Um, it's just beautiful. It's like going back in time. And it just, the place talked to me. And um, that's why I chose it. And um, I've never looked back. It's, it's been so healing for any people that have, um, have worked for us. Um, it's just for the horses, you know, the horses that come and, and rehab there. Like I said, we take in outside clients too. It's, it's just a healing place and uh, it's beautiful. You can never replace it. I mean, it's, and it is, it is, sorry, it, it is larger now. Ben, then by the end of the year, ended up selling me the back piece too. So of course, then I had to go buy my horses to fill it up. So my uh, CPA is still mad at me about that. Of course. <laughs> um, it, I've seen drone footage of uh, of it actually, and it's it's beautiful. Um, I mean, I'm I'm a little jealous uh, that you get to live there, uh, but it's it's absolutely <laughs> absolutely beautiful. And I'm it's nice to know that someone who appreciates that sort of history as as a very big history nerd myself, you know, whether it be thoroughbred or or any kind, um, to know that you you love that historic home and and that you love that place that you're living and you know, I kind of grew up in the middle of nowhere, of course, upstate New York, a little different than Kentucky. But when you're surrounded, you know, by by fields and animals and things like that, it is just an entirely different healing opportunity. So that's, that's amazing that when people come to that farm, they, they feel that for you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was actually a history and business major. So yeah, <laughs> so you were which is probably why I was a travel agent for 20 years too, you know, to travel and see history and appreciate people and places. Paul's Mill is truly, well, I still call it Paul's Mill. Safari North Paul's Mill is truly, truly, it's like heaven. It's like heaven. Um, so I know we talked a little bit about this, but how, how did you make your mark on the farm, if you will? You know, I know you talked about how much you appreciate it, but is there anything in particular 
um, that you did at this farm to really say, okay, you know, this is, this is my place now. This is my home for my family and my horses. Well, um, two ways. First of all, we hung all Shane's blown up stakes, winds pictures, wind pictures <laughs> everywhere. There's Shane sellers splattered all over the, the different houses and especially our home. And, and then I brought my safari into it. You know, like I said, I hunted for years. So I, I brought a few mounts. We've got um, a couple of buffalo. We call it the, uh, the North American room, but my son will shot a buffalo when he was seven years old or bison. And he was so proud of it. He was already shooting a, a 270. He's the one who passed away when he was eight. So it's like he got to live a lifetime and he was a little man and he loved to hunt. So, um, so I've got my hunting trophies around and, and then a lot of um, pictures growing up in the horse industry, me with my jumper back in the day. And um, funny, I, I sold a horse um, back before Will passed called Buona Charlie. And I found out later I had the blown up um, poster in my guest bathroom down here in Texas. And when I first met Shane, I said, I think you're in my guest bathroom on Buona Charlie. Did you ride him? So that was another weird connection with Shane. But yeah, just kind of put our, our mementos all around and honored, you know, the, the hunting industry and the horse racing industry right there together. Safari. It really seems like uh, whether it be Shane or the industry as a whole, you know, you really tried to get out uh, and you tried, you know, and you did, you did in a lot of ways. And it really, it really kept pulling you back in. It seems like this is very much a, a meant to be sort of situation, if you will, across the board. Um, that's what, that's got to feel, that's got to feel pretty nice, actually. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I, I say that about Hawaii too. It was in Hawaii that my little boy was killed in the car crash. And I lived there for a while for six months at a time. And I did a lot in the nonprofit world for kids and things and definitely consider myself a local on Maui. And the same thing that the horse industry has done to me is kind of what Maui does too. Now we treat it as a vacation. Mm -hmm home but i i have a, a home over there and um i say you know like maui the horse industry is the same and that it either pushes you out if you don't belong or it will pull you back it'll pull you back by your hair if you keep trying to get away and um paul's mill is a lot that way too so many of my friends especially during COVID, because we were so remote and so we were so safe out there a lot of friends came and would visit for a week and like i said we have you know a lot of different guest homes or our mill house and um, a lot of places for people to stay. So you'll have to come and visit us too. Oh, I'm CJ. you up on that offer, uh, Susan. I'll, I'll, I'll go to our director right now and say, listen, I'm gonna need those couple of weeks off because I'm headed down to Kentucky. So down I think it's part of your job. <laughs> you know, I think that I'll, I'll, I'll show this to her later and let her know that uh, that's yes. what I think as well. <laughs> that's great. Um, I know that Safari North is predominantly a broodmare operation. Are you, interested in keeping it that way for the foreseeable future or are you going to expand into any other areas of the industry? Uh, we really have. I mean, I've kind of gone back to my roots a little bit. Um, you know, of, of course I, I've enjoyed the racing, mm -hmm. but pin hooking, you know, um, my partner Charles and I, we were good at taking, you know, cheaper horses and, and making something out of them, you know, or taking something that might have a problem and fixing it. And that's such an exciting it, in, an exciting part of the industry because it's hard. I mean, everybody can see a good horse, but to see a horse that has potential, but may need to grow here, or, you know, let's work on his feet or this or that to take a horse that you might pay 10,000. Well, for example, Buona Charlie, we paid 14,000 for him and that was stepping up for us. And we sold him for 240,000 at the Texas sale, which is almost unheard of back then still kind of at the Texas sale. Um, so, you know, we just had some success, like I said, um, down at, at OBS, and I, I think we'll continue to do that for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the brood mares, I kind of got into it by accident by having some, you know, a, a filly like Janae that had so much heart that I just believe she would throw it to her babies. And, and then I've, I've stepped up and bought some nice fillies, and I'm, you know, Kenny McPeak and I are kind of working together on that. I'm getting me some really nicely bred fillies that hopefully go out there and then get some graded stakes under their belts and then turn them into mamas and then you know and then sell them my biggest concern there is to not get too big um unfortunately debbie and i got excited when we bought the you know the back end of the farm and we were having it's always fun to buy it's okay. the selling part that's hard <laughs> and and then you know then you know last year i think we fold 13 mares and now i think what i say we're up to 16 or maybe it's more maybe it's more than that debbie could tell you that 
Um, so, you know, we're going to keep buying and selling and uh, that's the exciting part. It is hard to sell though. You get so attached to them. Um, but that's you. Know, I think we'll keep doing and And really I bought the farm for layups too, to give, give these, um, these horses a break and, um, what a beautiful place to go and have a little spa for, you know, 60, 90 days, sometimes even sometimes 30 days. Cause we're so central to the places that we race. Um, so That's anyway, I, so I'm sorry, I'm seeing on my screen, some questions that are coming up, but I'm not seeing them quick enough to answer. No, no, I'm no. sorry. So if you just... want at the end, we can do, um, a bit of a Q and a session. So for any questions, yeah, no, I, okay, sure. Great. I'd love to do that. It sounds like Safari North is, is a sanctuary in many ways, not just for you and your family, but for the horses as well. Um, which is just, I mean, as beautiful as it is, that's, you know, it's that Kentucky bluegrass that I've heard a phenomenal about, uh, amount about through all of the full patrol farms. I'm, I'm very lucky to, to talk to and, and Debbie, Debbie first ward, who is uh, the farm manager. I know you've mentioned is, is great. She's, she's great at being in communication with me and she knows a lot about those horses. Oh my goodness. No, she does. Oh. Debbie is like our mother earth of our property. You know, that, and part of our logo, I use the, um, the kudu with the horns, that was our logo when I was Safari Bloodstock. But we incorporated um, something I'd seen traveling in Peru, and then it's also an American Indian symbol, but it's the, the hand and then the journey in the hand. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, the hand is kind of like healing, and that's kind of our journey. Like I said, I've, I've lost a son. Sadly, Debbie's lost a son. And I, I think just being at that farm, it heals people and it heals horses. And like I said, it, it started as a place for layups. It's grown into a, a small broodmare operation and um and you know we will we pin up our babies you know we'll we'll sell our winglings and it's kind of like the attitude we had at this sale at obs we were just at i knew what i wanted for my horses and if and i knew what they uh, what i felt like they were worth the potential they had because i'd watched them since they were yearlings and if someone else was willing to pay that and race them at least i got them this far and if they weren't i'm happy to race them too because I believe in them. I, I, I love that you were able to participate in, in Full Patrol season four this year because we have a good mix uh, of the large, of the very, very large farms, uh, such as Mill Ridge and Three Chimneys, who, who are phenomenal with, with the social media and getting us videos and information. And those farms, you know, just as well as Safari North are absolutely beautiful, but they, they, are, they, are, they are massive in the care and the, the crew and the staff that they have there to take care of these animals are just, they're phenomenal at their jobs and they, and they know exactly how to take care of these animals. Um, and then we're also sort of able to show the other side with your farm, Safari North, and then the farm that's, that's up here in Saratoga Springs, Old Tavern, who is a very similar size to Safari North. Um, and they actually do some pin hooking as well. So it's interesting how uh, the smaller farms, it seems like you tend to get into a, a couple different areas, have your hands in a couple different pies, because it sounds like you, you really have, um, well, you're well versed in the industry and are able to incorporate a couple different things on those farms, which it's, it's interesting just, you know, uh, as someone who started on the outside, you know, a couple years ago, as far as the thoroughbred industry is concerned to, to notice these things. And it's been uh, I mean, it, it's been such a wonderful opportunity for me to be able to visit farms like like Old Tavern and 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 speak to owners like you, where it's the the care that goes into taking you know very 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 good care of these animals is it's just top notch. I remember speaking to Debbie about uh, Janae's diet, which is something that we put on the Full Patrol website, and she went into phenomenal detail about all of the different kinds of fish oils and, and things like that, that she gives to the horses because of her years and years of experience. You know, she's like, well, listen, I've, I've learned that, the, you know, A, B, and C is the greatest thing you can give to a horse. And it, and it's, it really, I appreciate learning from, from people like that as well. Um, so I know she's a wonderful part of your staff over at Safari North. Um, so between Debbie and, and a couple other people, would you like to tell us more about your team over there and sort of everything you've got going on? Yeah, sure. Well, it's, it's funny because I was just um, having a little chat with Shane last night and he was, you know, complaining because he, he does our full watch. You know, he picks his son up at school, you know, three, four o'clock. And then every hour um, he does, uh, goes and checks them. Luckily our house is 
just right down the hill from the Folling Barn. So you can walk right up and check them, see where they're at. And then 10 o'clock, we have a night watchman come on and he works till six. And we've got a crew of about three or four, including Debbie. And the thing about Debbie, um, she's got to be the only farm manager in Kentucky that she gets out there and cleans the stall. Too. If you're not doing it right, she'll just say, just give me that. Um, she works her tail off for us. I've never seen such a hardworking person and then goes and, and sits down in the office in the mill house and, you know, does the billing and, you know, takes care of all of the details. Um, she's amazing. Um, she is, she, like I said, she is the healing mother earth of our property. And if, if one of our employees has a problem or something, she's right on it trying to solve it. And I really, I don't know how she gets sleep. She will fold every one of our babies. Now, sometimes we had one little difficult one earlier where it took three of us. I was standing there trying to film. She's like, put that down. I need you to grab this leg. Okay. <laughs> um, that's what I love about being a small operation like that. We are all hands on. We're all, in fact, even last year with COVID, when some of my friends were up, they got to witness, you know, the birth of a folks. So we'd be down, you know, finishing up dinner and it's like, uh oh, you know, Janae's waxing. Okay. You know, here we go. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's just been fun to be so involved with it. And, that, and that's what's important to me, not to be so big mm -hmm. and so corporate. I, I like being hands-on and healing. No, that's, that's wonderful. I, I, you know, that's one of the things, you know, we offer the live, the live cameras as far as full patrol goes and, and we love to be able to catch the birth. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we tell the farms and we tell people it's about the safety of you and your horses. Um, uh, but luckily, we've been able to capture a lot of live births and and people are just so excited to follow Janae. We've received a, a lot of very positive feedback on Janae. People are excited that she's the first Louisiana bred mare. Yeah, uh, to see yes. And, and as much as, you know, the breeding happens in, in Kentucky and also we have the farm in New York. Um, it's very exciting to sort of see horses from different areas of the country because as far as you know we know that we're the National Museum of Racing. Racing happens across the country um, with our brand new Hall of Fame that was recently uh, just redesigned and completed in 2020. We celebrate tracks from across the entire country. Uh, so it's, it's very fun and I think we're very lucky to feature a Louis Louisiana bred horse for the first time. So thank you very much for sharing her with us. I know people are yeah. excited to see that little foal. Louisiana, uh, Louisiana bred horse and the Louisiana bred farm owner too with Shane. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um, well, let's, we can get some of these questions that I see that are in the chat here. Um, would you advise a young lady wishing to enter the thoroughbred world to consider track work or go directly into farm work? Honestly, because I've been on the backside of the track and um, and I've been at the farms and I think she's safer at the farm <laughs> just because they're, <laughs> um, it, it kind of depends on, cause you gotta be tough. Um, that's, that's kind of part of the reason I stopped writing too, because my language was not very ladylike anymore. <laughs> cause you, you know, you're out there on the track and people are cutting you off or doing dumb things in front of you. And, uh, so it's, um, I, I think to begin the industry, I think to start at the farm, I really do. Um, Ra farm and racing is just so different. Racing is such such a passion, and 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 the the people at the racetrack are are gypsies, and um, and I'm a little bit of a gypsy soul myself. I think Pat Green did a song called Gypsy Soul. Um, you know that traveling. You know the racing season is like down here in Texas. It was it used to be you know three months, three months, three months. You know between our three tracks, and you know and then I felt sorry for the kids on the backside, which you know, they would be pulled out of school and go to a different school wherever their parents were working. Um, it's very much a gypsy life, whereas farm is very settled. I think if you're starting to learn the industry, I think you start at the farm. You, you start where life begins with a horse and um, you, there's a lot to learn there. And there, we have a secondary question. Do you pinhook foals to yearlings? Yes, so our, our weanlings, we judge a foal by where we think they'll peak. And if, if uh, a foal looks particularly promising as a weanling and will really show himself well or herself well, then we'll go ahead and sell them as wings. Plus that, that saves a year of expenses to carry them to yearlings. But it really is an art of determining is this foal look really good and really promising here or, you know, is it a gawky stage? Is this going to turn into, and, and then you look at the sire and the dam, you know, what, what, what their physical char characteristics are. I mean, that's why it's such an exciting 
industry because there's not a science to it. You know, it's, it's a lot of guesswork and, and it's a lot of cross fingers and hope I made the right decision work. That's great. I do have to throw in a comment. As you guys are talking about Safari North, I'm sitting here thinking, wow, geez, that sounds really familiar as you're describing the, the stream and everything. I have definitely driven past it so many times because that is one of the most gorgeous drives. Yes. And I know exactly where you're talking about right now. I can picture it in my head and the stream and are you, cause if I've got it right, it's a winding road, right? Yes. With, with a brick, there's like brick kind of along and a bunch of trees and then the stream. Mm -hmm. Okay. You I can see the mill house from the road. And if you stop at our gate, you can see my house. It's a red yes. brick federal house sitting up on the hill. Well, now you know where we are. You need to stop in. I would love to. Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm, have, I'm have a closer right. than me. She's going to beat me there. <laughs> you have two excuses to come. You can come visit me and then there we can go. go together to go visit Safari North and do more educational stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you, Anise, for joining me. I'm very glad that we were able to involve Amplify and some career discussions into this. And Susan, of course, thank you. We know you're very, very busy <laughs> as you discussed with us today. So thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day and talking to us about your career, your experience in the industry, and of course, for the Full Patrol fans on the call, uh, talking about Janae and season four of Full Patrol. So thank you very much. Uh an interesting fact, um, I chose today on purpose when you gave me a, you know, what day would work. Um, today is Will's, it would have been his 22nd birthday. The, today is my son's birthday. So it was um, an honor to get to spend it with you ladies. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for choosing to spend that day with us. We, we appreciate that. And, and of course, happy birthday to Will. I think he would, uh, I think he would be very proud of his mom to see everything that you've accomplished. Thanks. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to the email that uh, sent you the Zoom invitation link in the first place. And if it's for a niece, I can send that question her way. And if it's for Susan, uh, I will send that question over to her. So thank you all very much for joining us today. And thank you again to Anise and Susan for joining me. Great to Bye. meet you, Susan. Thank, thank, thank you guys. You. Nice to meet you. We'll see you at the races. Yes. Yes. Take care. Bye. Bye.